So the reason I was talking about all of these expansions and calculating changes in energy and so on is because we want to look at systems like this. The example I showed you in the first lecture, this is the Stirling engine, remember? So I explained in that lecture, the bottom is hot, it's put on hot water, and the top is cold. So as this blue piston moves up and down, there is a change in temperature of the system, and therefore a change in pressure of the system, proportional to the temperature. And also you can see that this little black piston is moving up and down, and this is changing the volume of the system. Okay? So this, the system I'm talking about is the gas inside of this container. Right? There's gas inside here. So this blue piston moving up and down is changing the temperature of the gas, and this black piston moving up and down is changing the volume of the gas. And when the piston is up, it's a large volume. When it's down, it's a small volume. And it's clearly cyclical, right? It goes up and down and up and down. It does the same thing over and over again. Okay. So this is an example of a heat cycle, which, as I said, is the topic for um, the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, so I'll draw this big, because I want to explain a lot of things about it. We can plot, then, the behavior of this system on the pressure volume diagram. As I said, as the gas temperature changes, the pressure is changing. <coughs> and also, as the driving piston moves up and down, the volume is changing. So as the wheel goes around one revolution, the pressure and volume inside the gas change, well, something like this. Okay. I'm going to talk more about what shape it is later on, but it goes around in some sort of cycle. So it starts here. Let's say, well, it doesn't really matter where it starts. It starts somewhere, goes this way, goes that way. So you've got a system with pressure and volume as a function of time going in a cycle, with, with some time period. Let's call the time period T. Okay. So as the wheel goes round and round, the pressure and the volume and the gas go round and round as well. Round here. Okay. So we can say, some things about this. The temperature of the gas is changing. The temperature of the gas will be a maximum at some point around here. Okay. Temperature of the gas is a maximum somewhere there. And we can call this temperature TH. That's the hot or high temperature. It's the maximum <coughs> temperature achieved by this system. And also, it will achieve its minimum temperature somewhere down here. So we can call this temperature TL or low. Okay. So there are temperatures. This is a line of constant temperature, more or less, in the high temperature and the low temperature case. Okay. Now, as the gas goes this way, it is expanding, right? Volume, as it goes this way, is expanding. So that means it's pushing the piston up. So going this way, the gas is doing work. It's pushing the piston. Okay? Coming back this way, the piston is pushing the gas back down. Okay? So going this way, the gas is doing work. Going this way, work is being done to the gas. The gas is doing work this way, from here to here, and then the piston is doing work on the gas from here to here. And we already said the work done was equal to the area under the curve. So the net energy, the net work generated by this cycle is given by the volume, sorry, the area 
inside the loop. So the area inside the loop here is the, the net work done. So from here to here, the gas is doing work. From here to there, work is being done on the gas. So to complete the picture, we also have heat. Heat is either going into the gas, if it's being heated, or if it's coming out of the gas, when the temperature of the gas is higher than the surroundings. Um, so for example, in, in the Stirling engine you see here, when the blue piston is at the top, the gas is being heated by the water. When the blue piston is at the bottom, the gas is being cooled by the surrounding air. So heat is going in or out. And in this case, we can say that um, heat is going in from somewhere here to about somewhere here. So over this part of the cycle, heat is going in. And over the opposite part of the cycle, heat is going out. Here, this red line is the heat going into gas, which I can call Q in. And the blue line is heat going out, which I can call Q out. So that gives you a whole description of this system. Okay. It's being heated and cooled. It's expanding and contracting. And in the process, it's producing an amount of work equal to the area inside of this curve. Okay. Um, there's one final important thing I have to define, let me do it here. This is because it's on, the, it's on the quiz this week. There's something known as the efficiency. Efficiency. Which is given the symbol epsilon. And it's defined as the net work done in the system divided by the amount of heat you have to put in. So why do we define efficiency in this way? Well, imagine this is a machine. You want it to do work. Okay? You want it to produce as much energy as possible. That means you want this top work done to be as high as possible. Okay? Q in is the amount of heat you have to put into the system. So for example, in a steam engine, that's by burning coal. In a car, the heat is generated by combustion of gasoline right, in, the, in the engine. So this is the amount of energy you have to produce in heat in order to make the thing work. Okay? So you want to make that as small as possible. The smaller Q in is, the less energy you have to give it to produce the same amount of work. Okay? So in a good engine, it should do a lot of work for a small amount of heat. That's a good engine, right? So a good engine will have a high efficiency. Because this is a big number, this is a small number. Okay. But there's a limit on how efficient your system can be. The first law of thermodynamics, okay. So over one cycle, if I start and then go all the way around and come back again, over one cycle, it's obvious that the total change in internal energy of the system is zero, because you start and end in the same place. Right? So it must have the same energy. 
Now, in this case, the first law of thermodynamics will tell you that the change in energy, which is zero, is equal to the heat, which is Q in minus Q out, minus the work done, W. Okay. And we assume that all of these are positive numbers. So that means that Q in must always be greater than W because this is positive, so if this equals zero, then this must be greater than that. And therefore, the efficiency, which is this divided by that, must be less than one. Okay. So, sorry to write down here, but just one more line. Therefore, the efficiency must always be less than one. Because efficiency is that divided by that. So, in a good engine, you want this number epsilon to be as high as possible, but the maximum it can be is equal to 1. It can't be more than 1. OK, I want to start off by talking about the, the Stirling engine, which I showed you a video of at the first lecture, and I've got the thing here. Um, so this is an example of a heat cycle. And you see, I explained the operation is driven by these two pistons. There's this little black square here which is moving up and down. This is called the drive piston. And there's the blue cylinder here, which is called the displacement piston. Okay. I'll just play that once more. Okay. Maybe I'll just draw it over. Okay. So the Stirling engine, I can draw something like this. Like this. So in here, you've got the drive piston, which is the black square, which moves up and down. And inside here, you've got the larger displacement piston, which is a big, a big cylinder like this, which also moves up and down. Okay. So this one is called the drive piston. And this one is called the displacement piston. Okay. And they move up and down. Okay. Now, the volume of the system is the volume inside here. And that is controlled by the drive piston. If the drive piston moves up, then the total volume increases. If the drive piston moves down, then the total volume decreases. So the volume of the system is controlled by the drive piston. The temperature of the system is controlled by the displacement piston. So you remember that we keep the bottom hot. You put it on some coffee or something, and the top is cold. The displacement piston moves the air either onto the top, where it's cold, or onto the bottom, where it's hot. So the displacement piston controls the temperature. The drive piston controls the volume. Right. So I'll play this video again, and you notice that they are out of phase. The displacement piston goes up first, and then the drive piston goes up 90 degrees later, 90 degrees out of phase later. Okay. So that they follow each other like this. One goes up, and the other one goes up, one goes down, the other one goes down. Okay. Um, so I can draw a graph of their positions then. So here I'm going to put position as a function of time, time t. And we'll call this displacement piston, I'm going to label as A. Okay. And the drive piston, I'm going to label as B. So if we suppose, first of all, that a displacement piston starts at the bottom, Owing to the circular motion of the wheel, it undergoes a sine curve. So it will follow a curve which looks like this. So it's, it's exactly, well, I've drawn it as an inverse cosine curve, but you get the point. Because it's a circular motion, it will go up and down in the sine curve. 
the displacement piston follows it slightly, sorry, the drive piston, B, follows it slightly behind. So the displacement piston goes up first, and then the drive piston goes up after it. So the position of the drive piston will look something like this. So this is the position of the drive piston B. So the volume, the change in volume of the system is exactly proportional to this position of the drive piston B. And the change in temperature of the system is determined by the position of A. When A is at the top, the system is hotter. And when A is at the bottom, the system is colder. OK? Right. Now, I want to simplify this a bit so that we can draw a simplified idealized diagram of it. So you notice here, the position of the drive piston is nearly constant, right? Nearly constant. And the same up here, the position of the drive piston is nearly a constant. Okay. And in the other cases, the position of the displacement piston is nearly a constant here and then here and here. So I can divide this system into a number of stages. Which should all be of equal size if I've drawn it correctly, like this. And you see that roughly, approximately, in this first stage here, V is a constant. Let me write it in black. For this first stage here, V is a constant. Then for this next stage here, the position of A is a constant. Then the next stage here, again, B is a constant. And then in the final stage, again, A is a constant. Here, B is a constant. Here, A is a constant. Here, B is a constant. Here, A is a constant. Like this, right? Okay. So I want to draw a pressure volume diagram of this system now. So I'm going to divide it into these four stages like this. And in each stage, I'm going to assume that either the position of the drive piston is constant or the position of the displacement piston is constant. So I'll call this one stage one, this one stage two, this one stage three, and this one stage four. Okay. So first of all, what's happening in stage one? In stage one, B, that's the drive piston, is a constant. That means the volume is a constant. because the position of the drive piston is a constant, the volume is a constant, roughly. Of course, it's not completely accurate. And the position of the displacement piston is going up. If the displacement piston goes up, that will force gas from the cold part to the hot part, and therefore the temperature will increase. Okay. So the volume is constant, and the temperature and the pressure are increasing. So on a PV diagram that looks like this, you start out somewhere. Here, you have constant volume, and sorry, let me draw it a bit higher. You start out somewhere here, you have constant volume and the pressure increases. Stage one looks something like that. In stage two, in stage two, the position of the displacement piston is at the top. Now, that forces all of the gas in contact with the hot part, so we assume that temperature is approximately constant. <coughs> the displacement piston is at the top. This forces all the gas to be in thermal equilibrium with the bottom plate, which is hot. Okay. So the temperature is constant, but the drive piston, that's this blue one, is moving up. And that causes the volume to increase. So the temperature is constant, 
but the volume is increasing. If I draw that here, that gives you a graph that looks something like this. Okay. And remember, we had a word for the type of expansion where the temperature is constant. We called it isothermal. So this expansion here in stage two is approximately isothermal. So three and four just do the same thing in reverse, right? In th three, again, the volume is constant, but the displacement piston is now pushing the gas towards the cold part, the colder plate, the upper plate of the container. So therefore, the temperature and the pressure decrease. They go down. So that looks something like this. And then finally, I'm afraid I've got to write it on down here. Finally, again, the temperature is now cold, but it's constant. And the volume is decreasing. So the final stage four looks something like this. And both of these, number two and number four, are both isothermal expansions, roughly. Okay. So we can make a cycle like this, and this cycle is indeed known as the idealized or the ideal Stirling cycle. So we can make up a Stirling cycle out of an increase in temperature at constant volume, then an isothermal expansion, uh, then a decrease in temperature at constant volume, and then an isothermal compression. And that gives you a cycle which looks like this. Now, in fact, I've made some assumptions here. Right? The position of the cylinder is not really constant here and here. It moves a little bit. Also, the gas does not immediately reach the same temperature as the top or the cold. It takes some time for heat to transfer. So if you draw the real cycle of a real Stirling engine, it will, in fact, be somewhere in between this, right? So the, the real cycle will be somewhere in the middle of this because the, the volume is never really constant. The temperature is never really constant. It's somewhere inside. But we can treat this black line as an idealized Stirling cycle, which will allow us to do some calculations, which we'll probably do in the next class.